Harris is a 16 year old uh, boy who has presented with complaints of stunted growth since eight years of age with history of melina for two months and history of hematochesia for one year. He also complains of on and off fever for almost seven years and he also complains of a left ankle swelling and pain with inability to walk. So um, on examination, his vitals were all stable. He has pallor, but there is no cyanosis, ictus, uh, lymphadenopathy or edema. And he has other multiple soft swellings present over the body. I'll come to the details later. And he also has uh, loss of secondary sexual characteristics and his standard staging was G2P1. His other systemic examination was normal. So this was the appearance of the lesions on the body. So one is on the right mandible and the other is on the left ankle. So according to the history, he says that these lesions were there since three years of age. However, recently he has a left ankle increased in swelling with uh, tenderness, with pain and inability to walk. So let's come to the first problem. So this is a 16 year old uh, boy who has presented to us with history of hematochesia and melina and on examination was found to have pallor, but there is no lymphadenopathy, no splenomegaly. And he has no history of any epigastric pain or other bleeding manifestations or any history of use of NSAIDs causing retching and uh, no history of any jaundice or abdominal distension. So because uh, because he does not have any features of esophagitis or peptic ulcer disease, we have ruled out those. But uh, because those are the most common things, we still consider them as our differentials. So our main differentials that were considered were peptic ulcer disease, a gastric or esophageal viruses, and other vascular regions because these are painless bleeding, man, painless bleeding. So on initial evaluation, he was, he was found to have a HP of 4.6 which is hypoproliferative microcytic hypochromic with uh, um, prolonged RDW. Uh, and his platelets were normal. He also was found to have vitamin B12 deficiency with an antiparietal cell antibody, which is POS2. Stool occurred, uh, blood was done, which was POS2, but stool written parasites were normal. So because his SOV is POS2 with severe anemia, and uh, our differentials were peptic ulcer disease and other vascular uh, lesions, we did a uh, gastroscopy for him. Initial gastroscopy was normal. Then we did a colonoscopy for him, which showed multiple muscular formations in the ascending, transverse, descending, as well as sigmoid colon. The largest was measuring 2 into 2 centimeters in the transverse colon. Then uh, we also done, uh, we did an ultrasound abdomen, which also showed other vascular malformations in the liver. Uh, so we have also done a capsule endoscopy to see the extent of the vascular lesions. And we also found that he has multiple uh, vascular malformations, which are ulcerated even in the small intestine. So coming to the second problem. Second problem is he has a uh, left ankle swelling for almost 12 years of for 12 years. However, the recent history of increase in sign with size and pain, discoloration and also uh, on examination was warm and tender. There is difficulty in uh, ambulating because of the pain. So because we have also uh, previously diagnosed, uh, he was diagnosed to have multiple vascular lesions in the GI tract. We also consider possibility of other vascular lesions in the joint or if there is a new septic arthritis or any hematoma formation or aneurysm. So at this time, we have done an ultrasound of the uh, of the ankle joint, which showed a vascular malformation of the ankle with a hemorrhage into the cyst or infection and multiple calcified prevalence were present. Oh, sorry for the spelling mistake. Uh, we also done an MRI MSK, which showed it is a venous, ven venolymphatic vascular malformation. So because he has vascular malformation in the ankle, in the jaw, and also in the colon uh, and the GI tract, we have done the CT angiogram, which also shows similar lesions in the left semitendinous muscle. We have done an MRI brain, which also shows multiple uh, lesions present in the brain. And ultrasound abdomen shows uh, lesions in the liver. Now coming to the third problem, he was on evaluation, he was found to have an elevated D-dimer with a prolonged PTINR and APTT with a factor 7 uh, deficiency of 15.7. So we consider possibility that he is having a non-over DIC or chronic conceptive coagulopathy and he was requiring multiple transfusions uh, during the ward stay. 
So uh, summarizing a 60, 16 year old boy who has presented to us with multiple vascular malformations since childhood uh, has currently presented with uh, probable thrombosis or infection of the left ankle lesion and with features of conjunctive coagulopathy and bleeding manifestations from the GI. So what are these vascular malformations? International Society for Study of Vascular Anomalies has classified vascular lesions as two, uh, has classified them into two, which is vascular proliferative regions or uh, neoplasm, which are known as hemangiomas, and vascular malformations. So usually we do tend to misnomer or misdiagnose patients with vascular malformations as hemangiomas. So how do we uh, differentiate vascular malformations and hemangiomas? Now, hemangiomas, they have high endothelial proliferation, whereas vascular malformation, they basically arises from the single endothelial cell, which can be capillary or venous or arterial. So both of them can be present at birth, but hemangiomas usually occur uh, during childhood, whereas vascular malformations can be present since birth. And how do we make the diagnosis? Vascular malformations is the diagnosis made by imaging modality like ultrasound, MRI, whereas hemangiomas, we can make the diagnosis clinically. So once again, hemangiomas are true neoplasms with pathologic cell proliferation. These tumors typically expect rapid postnatal growth and slow regression into the early childhood. Whereas vascular malformations, we comprised of abnormal form channels with a vascular apparatus that are lined by endothelial cells and they do not undergo any abnormal cellular turnover. Now, how do we classify vascular malformations? Now, vascular malformations are also classified into four categories. Uh, so based on the flow characteristics, they are slow flow and high flow or fast flow. Slow flow or low flow include capillary malformation, venous malformation, lymphatic malformation, whereas fast flow is AVMs. So this is an, um, so we have probably had seen patients with capillary malformations. They usually present with port vein stain and uh, most commonly trigeminal now, uh, it is usually involved in the trigeminal now distribution. Example is the Schreier Weber syndrome. Next is the lymphatic malformations. Lymphatic malformations are also rare and 75% of them occur in the cervicofacial region. They are classified as into macrocytic and microcytic. They are small crimson dome-shaped nodules with the as, which occurs as a result of intralesional bleeding. And how do we treat them? Sclerotherapy is the frequent modality. Coming to venous malformations. Venous malformations are the most common vascular malformations comprising 75%. So they usually have, uh, there will be a venous stasis in, uh, uh, sorry, there will be stasis of blood in case of venous malformation. So because of that, they tend to have thrombosis. They can form phlebolites, which can become calcified. So that is the pathognomic of vascular malformation. And the diagnosis is purely based on ultrasound or uh, MRI. So vascular malform venous malformations are dependent lesions. That is the size varies based on the position of the patient. But in case of a long-standing venous malformation, there might not be any changes with the position. So uh, clinically, how do they appear? They appear as bluish or purple superficial uh, lesions, which are often palpable and they're soft, boggy, compressible masses. Uh, they can be, uh, they're usually well-defined, but sometimes they can be diffuse and infiltrative. They do not have any signs of pulsatility or any local thrill because they are not any arterial lesions. So they occur in the early childhood uh, or sorry, uh, childhood or in the early adulthood period. They are predominantly occurring in the head and neck, trunk, as well as the extremities. They are also classified based on the size of it. So how do we diagnose? Like I said, imaging modality is how we diagnose it. Now, how when do we treat the vascular venous malformation? So we do not treat all the vascular venous malformation unless there is a history of bleeding or if there is a patient who has presented with pain or if there is um, a DIC a patient presents with DIC or if there is any impairment or for cosmetic purposes also. So what is the gold standard of treatment? 
Sclerotherapy is the gold standard of treatment. Uh, however, surgery can also be done. Uh, it, could, it could be an extensive surgery, hence it's not usually preferred. So what is the other modality we can do if we are not able to do sclerotherapy or surgery? That is giving oral serolimus. Studies have shown that oral serolimus uh, can reduce the vessel ectasia and secondary inflammation that can, ca that can be caused because of the lesion, therefore reducing the pain of it as well as the thrombophlebitis. However, it is not the primary modality of treatment and it does not cause complete resolution. So our patient has extensive GI malformations extending from the small intestine till the sigmoid colon. So extensive um, uh, resection could not, surgical resection could not be done because of the extensive environment. And sclerotherapy was also not, uh, could not be done because there are few areas with thrombosis. Whenever there is thrombosis within the vascular lesion, sclerotherapy is contraindicated. So how, how what do we do uh, for such patients who has profuse GI loss causing severe anemia in over DIC? We started him on oral serolimus medications. So after all those serolimus medications, his uh, HB was maintaining at around eight and he didn't have any further GI manifestations. So uh, because he has uh, manifestations from <coughs> childhood, we saw uh, with concern possibility of congenital vascular lesions. So what are the different congenital vascular lesions that we uh, usually see? The first one is stretch Weber syndrome, as I already discussed, which is a capillary malformation. The other one is cripple trino syndrome, which contains of a triad that is involvement of skin, bone, as well as subcutaneous uh, tissue. So they usually can cause uh, limb uh, extremities enlargement. There's also other man ma uh, vascular malformations like uh, Mark Parker Park Weber syndrome or heredity hemorrhagic telangiectasia, one Hippel-Lindo syndrome. So all of these also, there will be enlargement of the uh, or engorgement of the extremities will be present. The other thing that uh, we consider likely possibility for our patient is a blue rubber bleb syndrome. So this is a uh, cavernous venous malformation which includes the GI, the skin, spleen, liver and CNS. Our patient has all of this except for the uh, spleen manifestation. <coughs> So other differential that we other syndromic uh, uh, hemangiomas is osler weber rendo syndrome, which is an autosomal dominant. Um, he has an autosomal dominant inheritance. It also can present with mucocutaneous telangiectasis, especially in the oral and nasal region. And it can also involve the small intestine, the stomach and rectum. So this was our second differential. So for our patient, after starting oral serolimus, we have done a DNA banking and the results are abated to look for which uh, uh, clean, uh, congenital syndrome he fits into. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Uh, you said he has presented with bleeding, no? Is yes, it, uh, but serolimus will take time also. So how did you <coughs> manage his acute bleeding? You know? GI so initially, bleeding? he required multiple transfusions. Okay. Uh, and uh, after that, we have also given... Um, uh, uh, we have... All, other than... Uh, uh, so we have given blood transfusion. Other than that... Uh, no. So there is no active bleeding no. as of now? Yes, as of now, no. Another thing you said that the left ankle is query bar, is hematoma bar infected. No, what happened? Whether you were able to? So initially, because he had an elevated CRP, we have uh, give, uh, treated it as septic arthritis. Uh, I mean, not septic arthritis. We treated it as infection of the uh, vascular malformation. So we have treated with two weeks of antibiotics. However, the, there is no significant reduction in the size, no significant reduction in the uh, warmth or pain for him. So that's why we have considered doing a stereotherapy because we consider possibility that he has a thrombus underneath. So we did an ultrasound on MRI which is showing a significant thrombosis with flebolids present. We consider doing a stereotherapy but because he has all of this we are not able to. So we have uh, started him on physiotherapy for him and uh, uh, other than that um, nothing. We were not able to do that. The other thing you said, there's a part, you can have a CNS involvement also. No? So when you did CTO injury, it's a whole body CTO injury. Was oh. there any other lesions anywhere other than involvement of your GI, liver? He has a other pain, than this... pain involvement with the left medial rectus involvement. We have, uh, we have uh, 
we have uh, even involved neurosurgery they, uh, because the patient has no symptoms and there is no bleeding manifestations. I mean, there is no abrupt bleeding from the vascular malformation in the brain. We didn't uh, further do any uh, intervention for the same. But he's on follow-up from neurosurgery. Sorry. Okay. He's on follow-up on neurosurgery. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, out of these four, I think uh, uh, best, like, Good presentation would go to I spec from Medicine 5, Sharon. Okay.